be real. FNAF feels different. Like, not bad, just different, right? Like, I'm not even saying, oh, security breach bad, VHS horror, the way to go, it's the way of the future, Neuralink. I, I mean, like, even from FNAF 1 to FNAF 4, there was a difference in gameplay. It's just like, this is the game that used to give me the heebie-jeebies, keeping me up at night, checking monitors constantly, and now FNAF just doesn't have the same... Impact, right? And this isn't even an accurate representation of Five Nights at Freddy's anymore. This is. aims to dissect Five Nights at Freddy's by judging each mainline installment on both its fear factor and overall quality by looking through the lens of both gameplay and story. The reason for this is, whilst the earlier entries of the series' story can be roughly disregarded with the gameplay still being enjoyed, latter entries of the series show the gameplay and story being interwoven. To disregard story there would be to a disservice of the games, and overall it would be judging it unfairly as the games were designed to be experienced as both a game, but also a story. However, don't treat this video like a FNAF story breakdown. I treat myself like a bit of a FNAF agnostic when it comes to the story. Uh, who knows? <laughs> the FNAF story is too complex. So when I'm going to give any type of story information, it'll be directly from the games and maybe a sprinkling of just extra additional context just so it makes sense in the terms of this video. So to understand why Five Nights at Freddy's has changed, we need to go back and understand what made the first game so good. Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. Empty rooms, undusted tables, and faulty lights. An otherwise mundane building, designed to be filled to the brim with people, but cold and lifeless at night. Well, almost lifeless. Your name is Mike Schmidt, a name so average and meaningless that it might as well be your actual name on the paycheck. You are completely alien to this building. You come with no preconceived knowledge, no presuppositions of its past, present, or future. At the end of the day, any presumed control you might have is gone. It sat in a dingy little office. The only ambiance keeping you sane is a crappy fan on your desk. Prior to the release of Five Nights at Freddy's, many horror games had the same simple concept of safety. If there's a threat in the dark, get away from it. Simply put, distance equals safety. For example, Slender and the Eight Pages. You're going around trying to collect eight pages, that's how you win the game, and if there is Slender lurking around in the dark and you just happen to see him, run quick. And if you don't, oh, uh oh, oh. However, Five Nights at Freddy's doesn't give you the luxury of running away. FNAF forces you to sit in the tension, letting the distance shrink and shrink. The only power that you have in Five Nights at Freddy's is a very literal power. It's a power system, electricity. You've got two doors, a camera system, and some lights. Both those last two options, however, are designed to allow you to see where the animatronics are. However, the game directly punishes you for using any of those systems. It forces you to drop your camera, and just observe the room you're in, knowing that if you were to peer outside of your office, you might just see Bonnie lurking down your hallway. It's kind of brilliant, because think about when you see a spider on the wall. The thing that fears you isn't the idea that there's a spider there, it's when it runs away and you can no longer see it. FNAF forces you to pull your camera down, forces you to metaphorically blind yourself to threats. And yet juxtaposed to that, you do still have to keep your wits about you because if they finally reach your door and you haven't caught them in time...
you might not have been quick enough to stop your instant doom. And that is the gameplay of Five Nights at Freddy's 1. It's kind of perfect. Now, I don't mean perfect in the sense that it can't be improved. There's many of fan games to show that it can be improved, sometimes over improved. However, FNAF 1 does everything it needs to do to work. Every aspect of the game works the way it needs to work. Now, in terms of audience response, you could be one of the people who it just didn't click for you. This game did not scare me at all. I actually was not tickled in the fear hole one bit. In fact, I actually have more big blue balls than the solar system right now, which is impressive seeing the solar system previously held that record with two. So I actually had to grow an extra blue ball just to defeat that record. Or you could be one of the people who it really clicked for. Hello everybody, my name is Markiplier and welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's, an indie horror game that you guys suggested to me in mass, and I saw that Yami Nash played it and he said it was really, really good. Oh, the sounds, I don't like him. Wait, who are you? Oh, fuck! Or you could be someone who accidentally got dragged into this mess and now is solidified in the history books. You was new night guard watching the security cameras at a Chuck E. Cheese. Nope, not touching it. No sorry, doggo, I am not touching another Map Hat parody. The story of Five Nights at Freddy's 1 is actually pretty simple. By looking at the sheet of paper that usually displays the rules down the right hallway, sometimes there are changes in what's written there. Four newspaper clippings reveal an incident. On one fateful day, five children were lured into the back room of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza and murdered, robbed of the life they deserve. The killer? It could be anyone. No one was found. The face of the killer is anything you could imagine. To make matters worse, the lost bodies of the children were eventually found, as odour started leaching from the animatronics performing on stage. Their bodies had been stuffed into the suits. Suddenly the environment you find yourself in just doubles in its uneasy factor. There's something about this idea that you just can't be there. It's not safe. Something tragic has happened here. It reminds me of a social experiment done where fake real estate agents show potential home buyers a house, and once they get really excited, they inform the home buyers that there was once a brutal murder in the main bedroom. Instantly, every single home buyer who was keen in the first place was turned off the idea. Even though there would have been no reason for there to be any danger or anything, just the aura that there was something tragic there, turns them off. It's really fascinating, right? As humans, we just have a spiritual connection to these types of things, and we just can't help but distrust the invisible. Which is why Five Nights at Freddy's 2 suddenly becomes more uneasy when the invisible is given a face. The face of a purple silhouette. No doors. No safety. Just prayers in the night. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 emphasizes the fact that FNAF 1 teased the player with their inability to directly confront danger. Yes, FNAF 1, the animatronics will get close, but hey, at least you got those doors to protect you. In FNAF 2, you have none of that. In fact, the animatronics will get close. They will get into your office, and they will arrive right on top of you. Don't get excited, Twitter. All you have at your disposal to protect yourself is a shitty flashlight, and a crappy Freddy mask that works... most of the time. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 fundamentally is a game of stress management. Hey, is Foxy down your hallway but Balloon Boy's stolen your batteries? Well that's tough. Or maybe the music box is unwinding too quickly and you've got the Freddy mask on because Chica is in your office. Bummer. It's rough, buddy. Five Nights at Freddy's 2 does not let you slow down at any point. If you do not keep up with the animatronics intensity, well then you will be taken out. The screen bleeds red as the adrenaline fades. An old Atari-style minigame is presented to us, depicting the aftermath of multiple events at Freddy's. 
In one minigame we find ourselves as Freddy, being lured around the pizzeria by the puppets, who's showing us the remnants of what seems to be a vicious crime scene. Continuing on, we see Foxy running from his famous Pirate's Cove to greet the children in the main party area, and yet, it's too late. We see the puppet, confronted by the corpses of four children, so as a reflex, tries to make them happier by giving them gifts, but ends up giving them life. And finally, we see a smaller establishment, presumably Fredbear's, with a child locked outside. But before anyone's able to do anything, a car drives up, and a purple silhouette steps out and murders the child, leaving her tear stains to taint her afterlife. That right there is our murderer. That purple silhouette, that purple man. A murderer identifiable only by a color. And to add to everyone's shock, this game wasn't a sequel sequel, it was a prequel sequel. Set in the year of 1987, presumably six years before the events of Five Nights One. This was really disconcerting for this revelation to come out, as suddenly we all realised that the animatronics we've been facing off, hell, the animatronics we saw in those Atari-style minigames, those were the animatronics from the original diner, where the murders took place. Apparently, Fredbear's family diner, as the phone guy mentions in one of the calls. And this is why FNAF 2 really worked as a game that told a story, because it told you enough to catch your interest, but not enough to lose it. So, there was a lot of pressure for the third title to release. Following the first two games irreversibly changing the online zeitgeist of horror games eternally, Scott Cawthon had a lot to deliver in his final FNAF game. Theory channels haunted his mind when he tried to sleep. The sleep paralysis demon that was Meat Theory snuck into his room each night. Fake teasers came out showing carnival rides and roller coasters. Real teasers came out showing... Fredbear? No, is that... Oh, it's an amalgamation of all the animatronics combined! Scott knew he had to make this game the finale, and therefore the scariest of the franchise, and oh boy, did he deliver the greatest scare of them all. The fandom were horrified to realise the truth. The whole game was green! Gee, I hope that doesn't bother anyone. Yeah, so, uh, let's be real. FNAF 3 sucks, okay? Like, <laughs> like let's be real. Out of the entire FNAF series, this is the most fan gamey of the games. The gameplay is weirdly boring. And there's actually a lot to that, as there actually should be a lot on paper that would make this game work. An old, abandoned-style horror attraction faulty camera systems and apparitions of past animatronics. It even keeps on the pattern of the games, where the first game had doors and lights. The second game had no doors, but still had lights. And this game, neither. Should work, right? And the antagonist of the game was also a really creative choice for Scott Cawthon, as the first game showed the core four animatronics, where it wasn't overwhelming, but it was tense. The second game showed ten and more animatronics in that game. It was tense and overwhelming. However, FNAF 3 was intimate. It was a personal horror. Just a you and an intelligent beast that you were not allowed to take your eyes off. However, it didn't work. But why is that? Going back to the fact that this game is too green for even the most strong-willed paper straw loving turtle saving activists, this game's ambiance being too manufactured is a genuine criticism to be levied about this game. FNAF 3's idea is that this is a place of one of those horror pop-up attractions. One of those places you go with your new date trying to pretend like you're going to save her from an actual threat and she pretends like she's actually scared and that your twig arms are actually going to do anything to save her from the guy with fake makeup. Point is, this game feels too unironically cheesy. This environment is too overdone. This game doesn't feel scary because part of you feels like you're okay. You're not gonna be actually hurt. And Springtrap. His mechanics are interesting. What you do with him is you have to lure him around the pizzeria by using audio lures to take him away from you. Now, 
If you've been paying attention to this video, you'll notice why that's an instant error on Scott's behalf. FNAF 1 worked because it removed your ability to control distance, and distance equals safety. And yet here we are with FNAF 3. You are able to control the distance between you and the antagonist, pushing the antagonist away. Relativistically, it's as if you're running away. The idea is that finally you're able to control distance, and that bores you. Why worry about a threat if you know he won't reach you? And when he does reach you... Uh, it's mildly... unnerving? Ah! Springtrap's jump scare sucked, and Scott Cawthon knew that. It's one of the reasons we have a FNAF 4, is that it was a letdown to the fans. But that's not where FNAF 3's strength lies. The strength lies, once again, in the story. Continuing the trend of Five Nights at Freddy's telling its story in a unique way, FNAF 3 uses Atari-style minigames to give us insight into more horrid events at Freddy's. However, perpendicular to the last game, which showed the aftermath of most events, here we see direct moments of the franchise. The main gameplay of the game leads you to unlocking a series of minigames throughout each night, where an animatronic finds themselves following a ghostly Shadow Freddy to the back room where they are taken out and dismantled by a familiar purple silhouette. Completing all five nights and you see this moment. The souls who once resided in their suits have escaped their shells and they're ready to attack this purple man. The purple man in his hubris grabbed hold of an old friend, the golden rabbit suit, laughing. He, he knew he'd won, except for that. The suit's internal systems, the spring locks that help hold an endoskeleton straight to the suit, clamped down on the purple man's flesh, leaving him cold, shaking, and bleeding. Here we see what happens to the purple man. Which means that the very spring trap that we've been playing against, the very antagonist we've been scared of, that was him. That was the killer. That was the very man who caused everything to happen. And that is the bad ending of Five Nights at Freddy's 3. You heard me. Bad ending. Each minigame gives you a task to complete in your next night shift at Freddy's, whether that be double-clicking a little picture of Balloon Boy, or a little statue of Shadow Bonnie in the corner of your room, or perhaps taking the hex code of purple, flipping it, and dialing that into a wall, which was a creative choice. Oh look, here's a wall. Let me just dial in my phone number. Beep boop boop beep boop beep. In these smaller minigames, we see the story like never before. We're given a glimpse into the past of Fred Bear's family diner. We see Chica giving cake to children, Mangle on a quest, and that little twat. But by getting through it all, we get to the end and see a big party room, with a child stood at the back. As he walks to the front, he's greeted by a few friends, each ordained in a certain Fazbear character mask. This moment shows us the peace that these characters finally get to have. FNAF 3 is not even close to being the scariest game of the franchise, but it's definitely one of the most poetic. The idea that these children suffer consistently for years, but maybe there was a chance that someone would save them. Maybe there's a chance that they get one more day. Their happiest day. It was time for a change. The weight of FNAF 3 not being scary weighed on Scott Cawthon's conscience, and therefore, FNAF 4 was going to be a return to what made the series great in the first place. No longer would you be able to control the tensity of your animatronic foes by moving them around. This time, you're at their disposal. No longer will you even have a camera system to look at them. FNAF 1 was great when it blinded you to threats, so this time the only way to see threats is by going up to a door and checking for yourself. But hey, don't even be too hasty with that flashlight. Just listen. And in the biggest change of them all, no longer would these animatronics just be reflections of real life children's entertainment, but instead they would be very literally the stuff of nightmares. Scott Cawthon wanted to depower you, and how did he do that? He made you a mere child.
face to face with a very literal nightmare. A flashlight held in your hand, scanning a room in fear. The paradigm of Five Nights at Freddy's was shifted entirely. For the first time ever, you're moving. And not just are you moving through an alien environment, but your own bedroom. Something so intimate, a place where you're meant to be safe, especially as a child. The only way to keep yourself safe is to flick on that flashlight. Blink and you'll miss it. If you think you hear breathing at a door, you can wander up and check the hallway. But how can you trust your own self when your hands are sweating and shaking? And if you use the flashlight at the wrong time, well, that's a bummer. The magic of Five Nights at Freddy's was back. In my humble personal opinion, Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is the scariest FNAF game. That is debated, as a lot of people think that it's too manufactured, it's too overdone, it has too many teeth. I get that, and I know I just criticised FNAF 3 for being too manufactured, but when it comes to FNAF 4, all the other elements just really embrace it. For this, we need to talk about sound. As Five Nights at Freddy's 4 uses sound to an extent that the FNAF series had previously not seen. While sound, of course, is used in the other games to add to the horror experience, FNAF 4 uses sound in a way that makes it the core driving force of the horror. It was Danny Boyle who said that 70 to 80% of cinema is sound, and while that's a controversial statement, even to a little cinematography directy boy like me, like you sound engineers, I've seen str <laughs> Just, I've seen EQ straight. I fucking can't say. You sound engineers. I've seen EQ graphs straighter than your own. <laughs> Sake, I can't say it! Sound is vitally important, and it is, in a lot of cases, the driving force of horror for Five Nights at Freddy's. And if you don't believe me, I have a piece of scientific information that you can't rebuttal. I'm not even taking the piss with this one. I need you to trust me on this, because Garrett Williamson's unloved disowned child, FNAF Not Scary, is genuinely the perfect example of how Five Nights at Freddy's needs sound to be scary. Throughout Garrett's Not Scary series, he takes the clips from the games out of context, strips them of their sound, and replaces them with something funny. And by funny, I mean... So let's put it to the test, eh? Let's see Five Nights at Freddy's with the original sound and Five Nights at Freddy's with the added sound. FNAF 4 uses sound to create a sense of tension, to create a sense of unsurety, to make you ask what's out there in the corridors before you even get the chance to see it. Because your imagination gets run wild. The idea that you can't even turn on your flashlight because that could be what kills you? That's brilliant. This idea of really just needing to trust yourself when you're not sure is terrifying. FNAF since day one has been about limiting your vision, making you question, do I let the threats get any closer or am I safe enough to not worry? FNAF literally peaks at FNAF 4 from its core aspects. Scott Cawthon just made FNAF 1 again, but better. And that's why I think it's the scariest game of the lot. But beneath the darkness of the night, confusion arose. As for the first time ever, your character wasn't just some name on a paycheck to be ignored and replaced with your own. Instead, who you play as mattered. Whose house is this? Whose nightmares are these? Is that an IV drip? Who am I? Between each night, you come face to face with the answer to those questions. You are a mere child. first night you find yourself locked in your room as someone's done something to you again. To bully you, it seems. To mock you, to tease you. Who is mocking you in this situation? It's your brother. You, the crying child who just wants love from his family, and a brother who 
just gets a kick out of seeing you squirm. You and your brother live down the road from Fredbear's family diner, home to both the Spring Bonnie and Fredbear animatronic. These gold animatronics we've seen once before. You have an adoration for the place, hence your psychic friend Fredbear plushie that you take everywhere with you and sometimes hear the voice of, but the animatronics themselves, they scare you too much. On the fifth day of playing, we find out it's your birthday. A party is to take place at Fredbear's, but you're terrified, and your brother takes utter advantage of that. Michael sees his crying brother on the linoleum of the Fredbear's family diner floor. Over his shoulder, he gets an idea. The little worm is terrified of those animatronics. So, why wouldn't it be funny just to get him closer? Dragging him over to the front stage, he has an idea. An idea that makes him smile. What if, what if he made his own terrified brother give the animatronics he's afraid of a kiss? That's, it's pathetic. Picking up his brother, lodging his brother in the jaw of the animatronic. It's hilarious. Watching his tears mesh with the plus jaw. Watching his squirming little body try to wriggle out of the... Crunch. Tears are replaced by blood. Michael watches on. What have I done? He thinks. This moment is the cornerstone of the FNAF story. It's the moment where everything goes wrong. So everything seems clear gameplay-wise, right? We have the gameplay being you, the crying child, terrified of the animatronics to the point of nightmares, that's also influenced by your brother. But what does that mean for the larger story? I mean, we have the names of these characters, we have a crying child and an older brother, but who are they? Seriously. And also, we have this house and this family in a mysterious girl's room. Who are they? Like, they don't fit. And like, hold on. Was that the bite of 87? Everyone's dog, mother, and child started trying to fit FNAF 4 into the story that we already had. We try to fit it into our presuppositions of a timeline, but it just didn't work. And why not? The only explanation we could have is that it has to just all be a dream. <clears throat> but the reason they didn't understand is that Scott Cawthon was no longer telling the same story of those five missing kids. That story was wrapped up. We're in a new age, a new era. In fact, part two of the FNAF story is right in front of us. Seriously, check the timeline of this video. This entire FNAF 4 section has been part of part two. Scott Cawthon no longer let gameplay and story be two separate entities in Five Nights at Freddy's. From now on, they would be inextricably interwoven in their very DNA, infused completely. You couldn't play a FNAF game without experiencing this story. And that was vital in the next installment of FNAF, where Scott Cawthon was taking us deep below ground, where memories sleep. The first thing we hear in FNAF's sister location is two men talking. There's no doubting what you've achieved on a technical level. They're discussing the titular character of the game, Baby. She can dance. She can sing. She's equipped with a built-in helium tank for inflating balloons right at her fingertips. She can take song requests. One of their names at the end is even revealed. With all due respect, those aren't the design choices we were curious about, Mr. Afton. If you have a general awareness of the FNAF story, you've probably touched on the Silverized novel, where a character named William Afton is introduced and revealed to be a killer. The killer. William Afton is the purple guy. That had a bit more of a kick to it back in 2016. I really am actually kind of disappointed that it doesn't land as much as it should have. No longer were the characters that we were hearing about just sprites on a screen, but they were characters with personalities and voices and families. We started to learn of who they were intimately. Now, Scott had to be very careful with that, however, as remember FNAF 2? How you have to give enough of your story as to be interesting, but not too much as to lose interest? Well, we're on that balance beam right now. We're discussing all these new ideas, but if we reveal too much, it becomes too uninteresting. So let's explore Five Nights at Freddy's sister location, shall we? Enter you, Michael Afton. The son of William, and the brother of the crying child. There's no care to the place you find yourself in. 
You have to crawl through vents that reek of stories you don't want to hear. Making your way to a control room, you look around and see blinking heads on a stand and creepy masks. Let's give her some motivation. Press the red button now to administer a controlled shock. In doing so, you are forced to torture the very animatronics you thought you were paid to maintain. And whilst you're paid to maintain them, the money isn't the reason why you're here. Entering the furthest room from the elevator, a blue haze fills the air as you arrive, only to meet a robot behind glass. A robot that reminds you of the sister you lost years ago. And so, you'll do anything to make it all five nights. Crawl, flash, shake, anything to make it to the end. And finally, at the end of it all, you come face to face with her, baby. She tells you that she's... Broken. And that... I can't be fixed. And because you care, if she's your sister after all, you need to make sure she's okay. And so, you trust every word she says. She takes you into the darkness. Go forward. You believe her. Go forward and left. You continue to follow her. Keep going. And then you make it. The room you find yourself in is colder than the last one. On the ground is remains of the animatronics you've seen over your shift. Hold on. Something's... <laughs> You'll wake to the feeling of dry eyes, as if someone had rubbed a cotton swab across them. What happened down there? Was it some sort of bad dream? You feel a pit in your stomach as an ache in your back from an undescribable weight fills your bones. You decide you need some air. Questions start filling your head. And that, my fellow miners and crafters, is the story of Five Nights at Freddy's sister location. Gameplay and story. It's interesting, right? For the first time ever, we're not looking at the FNAF environment as an onlooker. FNAF 1, 2, 3 kind of gave us this perspective of an outsider, as if we were reading a newspaper, understanding glimpses of a story and just feeling like your imagination fills in the blanks. From now, we know this story. We're part of it. We're, we're characters in the story itself. We're not reading the newspaper, we're in the newspaper. Sister Location, gameplay-wise, is all about breaking rules. The first night sets up this concept of a gameplay loop. You enter the control panel, shock some fellas, go to baby, shock her a bit, and get out of there. And then in the second night, it goes to shit. The idea is that Sister Location doesn't let you get comfortable in one routine. You always are doing something new, and I kind of love that. A horror game, in my opinion, is all about this idea of trying to survive while you're not sure how to, right? While FNAF 1, 2, 3, and 4 have the same issue that you get good at the game over time, it solves that issue by giving you a bonus night and then a custom night, which rewards you, saying, hey, this game's no longer scary to you, but at least it's now just a test of skill. How good can you get? It's like a pat on the back. It's saying, hey, you overcame your demons. Sister Location is vastly different to that. Every moment in this game is designed to test you for the first time. I love the idea that you're crawling through Ballora Gallery or Funtime Auditorium completely unaware of how to survive. You don't know if you're going to win because you don't know even how to win. Scripted moments like Ballora spinning in front of you or Funtime Foxy's Night 3 jump scare terrify you because you don't even know if you're playing right to begin with so when you think you're losing, that's horror. But that's where there's an issue to Five Nights at Freddy's sister location. Uh, it's, it's the one night stand of the FNAF world. You can only play it once, 
or watch it once. Once you understand what happens in the game, it's not really that scary anymore. Other than the Night 2 Funtime Freddy battle, there's not much replayability to Sister Location, and that's a genuine criticism to be levied about the game as well. So the gameplay is good first time round, it just struggles to compare any second time. The best way to play Sister Location again is to introduce someone new to the game, have them play it and you watch their reaction. It's like watching Fight Club for the first time, you don't understand what's happening and then the second time it's a whole new experience if you're coming into it with the idea of someone who doesn't know what they're doing. But the reason Sister Location is the way it is gameplay wise is because it's more focused on being a story game. Sister Location tells the story of the Aftons, and it becomes the cornerstone for modern FNAF. William Afton, Mrs. Afton, Michael Afton, Evan Afton, and Elizabeth Afton. The father who descended into madness, the mother who watched, the brother who had to learn lessons, the brother who never got the chance, and of course, the fateful sister. And whilst the story had no solid conclusion yet, at least we had something to go off. From FNAF 4, we were kind of in the dark. We were descending into madness, some might say. And now, that's okay though. Sister Location doesn't give us an ending to the story, but at least it gives us context for what the story is meant to be. We were kind of left in the dark after FNAF 4. And there's a lot of plot threads remaining from the FNAF story. What happened to Springtrap? He survived the FNAF 3 fire after all. What happened to the missing children's incident? Which, which ending, FNAF 3, was the actual true ending? What about Enid, now escaped from Michael Afton's body and living in the sewers? What about the soul of the puppet, who still yearns to protect the kids of the past? And as an internet community, we all expected Scott to give us something to look forward to, some context for what was happening, but all we got was radio silence. And a pair of green eyes. Hey, what's that game on Scott's website? Oh! <laughs> FNAF is scary again! <laughs> Five Nights at Freddy's 6 takes what makes the latter entries of the series good and the early entries of the series good and moulds them together. Who are you as a character? It is important, but it's still vague enough to just treat it like it's yourself. The horror gameplay of FNAF 6 is split into two main parts, salvage and your night shift. When salvaging, you come face to face with horrors of the past. There's no avoiding it, no masks, no lights, no doors. Just a piece of paper in front of you that tells you to note their movements if you see any. To win the game, you're forced to stare back into the eyes of fear. FNAF 4, in my opinion, is the best FNAF game, horror-wise, but this is the best FNAF horror moment. It's just... fucking great. In the alternate night shift section, you find yourself in a small tin room attached to a large ventilation system. Any animatronic you find yourself salvaging ends up part of that system with you. Similarly to the first game as well, the very act of completing the game is punished. You're required to complete multiple tasks on a monitor to end your shift. However, each task's progress causes auditory disruptions that may alert any threats that's lurking nearby. Let the sound linger too much, and be confident you won't be alone for much longer. Rah! Oh no, rah! <laughs> okay, uh, it's not a FNAF game if it doesn't have a peg leg. I don't know if it's the third game curse, but the jump scares are... Mid. I, I guess you could be scared of them if you're terrified of... PNGs! <laughs> That's gonna end up in a Nemo out of context compilation. But you can't blame Scott too much as he was trying to save data in this game file for a new part of the game entirely. Daytime. In the daytime you get to somewhat breathe. You get to decorate a pizzeria and buy novelties to enrich the atmosphere. Some of these items do feel strange, however. You couldn't beat that maze game earlier and the candy robot seemed to neglect to tell you that story. And that robot to buy for five bucks? It seemed sketchy. A lot of these items seem to have something hidden inside and 
an egg, maybe? If this is your focus, if daytime is your focus and you just neglect salvaging any animatronic, you can complete the game completely scot-free. And you'll be rewarded with the ending of... <laughs> Wait, scratch that, reverse it. What did that egg baby have to say? <laughs> and it's at this point you might wonder what's going on. Five Nights at Freddy's 6 has seven different endings. Yahoo! In terms of fixing the issues of replayability that Sister Location had, FNAF 6 nails it by making the game somewhat of a custom night. You control how much fear factor there is in the game. You control how much challenge there is in the game. You control all the elements. It's kind of brilliant in that regard. You know the current trending game Buckshot Roulette? Well, one of the things that fascinates me is the idea of its horror and fear factor. For the most part, it's not that scary. It's tense, but not that scary. Until the moment you choose to aim the gun at yourself. In that moment, all surety goes out the window. Every bit of game theory and odd stacking that you had suddenly disappears. You're making a mistake, your brain cries out. And that's what it's like to salvage an animatronic in FNAF 6. Suddenly, every bit of your mind saying, I can handle this, turns against you. And you feel fear. And in tradition, for the third game of the series, FNAF 6 ties off the game in a poetic way. The story of the Aftons is rounded off, with Michael Afton getting his send-off, the father finding a sweet spot in hell, and the victims finding their place in freedom once again. It's poetic not just because it's a send-off to the games as their internal story, but it's poetic because it's a send-off to the community. It's a way of saying thank you and looking back at the last few games in an introspective way and saying, yeah, we made it to the other side. And that's it. The main story, the main arc, Five Nights at Freddy's complete. Only to be remembered now by clickbait thumbnails and crazy theories. A relic of a really booming 2010s past. But, as the great Karl Marx once said, where there are memes, there are money. And therefore, many a companies were excited for Scott Cawthon opening up the IP of Five Nights at Freddy's to be bought. Enter Steel Wall Studios and no one else. And yes, Scott Cawthon released a giant page saying how there'd be marketable plushies for everyone. There'd be slippers for everyone. A FNAF everything, I think. I'm just hyped for the FNAF icy pole drops so I can toy cheek. But the main point of this is that now, FNAF as an IP was in the grasp of an indie game company called Steel Wall Studios. And the next big thing on the horizon is Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. Disclaimer time! This this video is about the mainline parts of FNAF, right? So FNAF World, not gonna be part of it because that's just not scary. Uh, FNAF VR and AR, I'm not including them as they aren't put on computer and that's kind of a different ball game. It would not be fair to compare those games to the previous ones when they are very literally different experiences altogether. It's the future, bitch! There is too much to speak about Security Breach, especially with the amount of time I've left in this video to talk about it. There's a brilliant video by Design Frame, which is called FNAF Security Breach is a Fundamentally Broken Game, and I actually have to agree with every point they make. It's... it is sad. But let's be clear, this part of the video is not designed to haymaker any Security Breach fans, how dare they enjoy their furry little game. No, this part of the video is just to dissect it in contemplation with the previous games. There is a dichotomy between what this game has to offer and the previous games. And to break down why the game fails in so many ways, it's important to look at those games. So, let's take a look. I'm Gregory for this part of the video. You can tell because I shaved. So for this part, for this section of the video, we'll be omitting any level of story relevance for this game, as this game's story is completely horrific and overcomplicated at best, and utterly nonsensical at worst. So we'll be approaching this game through the lens of what Steel Wall intended. So I'm sorry, believers, but that does mean no Gigamontes. Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach. 
And that is the first issue of the game right there. I shit you not, I believe that. The words Five Nights at Freddy's is slapped on so proudly, but almost in vain. Because Five Nights at Freddy's, since day one, was about breaking the mold of horror games at the time. And that was both with its style, but with its gameplay. It was breaking the style and the mold of major free roam horror games of its time. And yet, here we are, and FNAF is having this identity crisis, trying to embrace the style of major free roam horror games, whilst also not doing that. It, it becomes this juxtaposition, but in a bad way. It becomes this melding of two dichotomous ideas that don't link. Now, that's not to say you can't have free roam FNAF games. We'll get onto that later. But this game struggles at trying to integrate the ideas of Five Nights at Freddy's into the free roam style. There are ways to do this, but this isn't it. It was like FNAF had an identity crisis. It wanted to go bigger and better, but as that was the only target and goal in mind, it was easy to conflate the idea of hitting the target and getting a bullseye. FNAF security breach is a victim of that. It was too big for its own good, and therefore, there was no direct goal in mind to really sell it. Seriously, watch that video by Design Frame, it's perfect. In Security Breach, you play as Gregory. And that is the second issue with this game. Steel Wool decided for Security Breach to flaunt human models all over the place, from Gregory to Vanessa, making this world, instead of a human and real world, a very cartoonified world. Now, whilst cartoonified horror games can exist and work, it's not the style that FNAF had. In fact, it's the opposite of the style. The idea of FNAF was that it was very real, it was very gritty. And yes, there were cartoonified antagonists. They were cartoonified because they were from children entertainment restaurants. They still were in the real world. The closest we get to seeing a human caricature within the entire franchise is when you see two electricians hung at the stages of the Ballora Gallery in the Funtime Auditorium. And we can see that and get a little shocked as, that's us. That's us. But you know who isn't us? This guy. FNAF always reveled in the idea that there's something in the dark, something unearthly, uniquely scary out there waging on your death. But when it comes to FNAF Security Breach, there's none of that. All the characters are ungodly human. They're too sentient. You can't believe that they're just robots. But then contrast, they have about three voice lines each, so you hear them say the same thing over and over and over, and all immersion is shattered. They're all too human. They're all comically evil with their voice lines. They're laughable villains that don't actually really prove any threat. Even the main villain, villain, is a person in a costume, but they show no true threat. They just, oh, I shouldn't do that. That's a tech- no, I can't. Now, I understand many of you may have heard what I just said and disagreed, and fair enough, as many of the major horror characters from all of pop culture are human. However, there's a distinction to be made between what Security Breach does and what those horror characters do. When it comes to horror and thriller and many types of good versus evil type fights, there are usually two types of villain. You have the archetype of a mastermind and the archetype of a monster. The monster archetype is scary because it's just illogical. It's out there to get you. It has no rhyme or reason. It can't be predicted. Whether the mastermind is the opposite. It's too predictable, but you can't predict it because it's too smart for you. It's one step ahead of you. You don't know what it's got planned. You don't know what it's thinking. And therefore, scary. I think a good game that actually justifies that distinction is, quite funnily enough, Poppy Playtime. There are issues with Poppy Playtime, but for when it comes to their villains, they do a pretty solid job. Think Chapter 1 with Huggy Wuggy as the monster archetype, but think Chapter 2 with Mummy Longlegs is trying to lean more towards the mastermind archetype. With Huggy Wuggy, you just run down vents, trying to escape, but with Mummy Longlegs, it's different. She has a plan for you, she speaks to you, she leads you down this path that you don't understand yet. It's scary. And that's the issue with Security Breach. We have these animatronics that have the minds as if they're sentient, so they should be masterminds somewhat, but then they're not. They're meant to be mindless monsters. 
And that doesn't make much sense. Especially because, if we're gonna dig into some level of story, they're meant to be mind-controlled by... Afton? Or Vanny? It's unclear. But the point is that they're mind-controlled. They're meant to be smart. They're meant to be under some... Spell! It's so confusing! It's such a bad game! However, there is one time where it worked. There's one time where I genuinely felt fear at the layman animatronic. And it was this moment right here. You think you're better than me? Yes. Alright, we're gonna save. Oh my god, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Astral David Spiff. In trying to tease the FNAF gods, tried to beat Security Breach without sprinting. To do this, he used game-breaking glitches to time travel, which had unintended consequences. It gave birth to a foe, Gigamonty. I completely take back what I said about Gigamonty not being part of this video, because I knew from the moment I saw him that this was the way to fix Security Breach. This beast, this creature, had one goal in mind. When it knew where you were, it would chase you down, no matter your status, and kill you. This is how Security Breach should have been. No cheesy voice lines that dull your experience, making you apathetic to the threats. Instead, there's silence. And silence. And silence. Until it's smashed by threat charging you down on a hunt for your head. It's so scary. You see the, the moment of realization. You see the tension in his shoulders as he realizes he needs to run and run he does, but in vain. And I get that this is opposed to the style of FNAF, but Security Breach already is opposed to the style of FNAF. If you're going to be that way, commit to it. Both can work, but as long as you commit, you can't half-ass either of them. You can't sit on the fence. An added bonus of Gigamont is that you're stripped away from your ability to use the Faz Camera, the Faz Blaster, and the Faz Bear. And that means you're stripped of all your hope. In the moments that Gigamonty is charging after you, all you hear are his raging, charging footprints. And that is terrifying, but just like in all FNAF games, you're called to just execute the task, execute the objective, no matter how you feel. Like in FNAF 1, when you hear Foxy's footsteps, you know just press the door button on the left, you'll be okay. Or in FNAF 4, you just listen close if you hear breathing, close the door. That's all you need to do. It's scary, but you just have to complete the task. That's all you need to do for Gigamonty. Give one thing to evade him. Not an easy thing, but just one thing. For example, get to the nearest charging station. They tried to implement that with Moon, but Moon's a glitchy mess that's unpredictable and half the time you don't even know where he is, so he's not much of a threat. The fact that sound is the thing that's calling you to action works way better than Naughty boy. One of the biggest drawbacks from FNAF Security Breach is that the creators just weren't willing to lean into the horror aspects of FNAF. They wanted to make these characters fun and personable. They wanted to make this environment fun and childlike, but they forgot to juxtapose it with the fear factor. They forgot to make it unnerving. They forgot to make it Five Nights at Freddy's. It's a furry paradise. I hate to bring up Poppy Playtime twice in a video, it makes me physically ill. However, Poppy Playtime Chapter 2 just does stuff well. That main area where the train station is, that play area, that's brilliant. That's very reminiscent of what the daycare and security breach is like. But where one place looks like you want to send your kids there, the other place looks like Chernobyl. You expect to see mutant deers climbing out, not Mickey Mouse. And that's why at the end of the day, what FNAF Security Breach needed was Ruin. They needed Ruin to come out. And when it did come out, it solved many of the issues of Security Breach. But it was kind of too late. Security Breach was already done, out there, for years, you know? And at the end of the day, you can't rely on a DLC to act like a brand new gamer series. Now, 
I would make an entire dedicated part of this video to Ruin, but I don't think that's fair, as this is meant to be about the mainline installments of FNAF, and it's just a DLC. Ruin deserves its own part of this video, but by the logic of this game, that's not fair. That's like also discussing the Halloween update of FNAF 4, so I'm not bringing it up. However, I might delve into the more wacky sides of FNAF if you guys want it, so please, tell me if you do. Let's go off script for a second. Security Breach... Security Breach is not a good game, but that's okay. I'm not a hater of Security Breach. There's a lot of things I enjoyed about it. There's a lot of memories that I still cherish from the time it came out. I still love the lead up to it. I have memories from the time it came out. I remember my first reaction to the Afton ending. I remember my first reaction to the mic room. I remember my first reaction to all these moments that made me go, Oh, this is a game changer. But it is still a broken game. To me, Security Breach is like an injured dog. And I, I mean that with as much love as I can give. You still love your pet dog, you still love them, but they, they they have training wheels. They are a dog with wheels. It's it is a little stupid, but you still love them. <laughs> but it's not the be all and end all. FNAF 3 was a rough game that you don't really replay. FNAF 5 suffered from many gameplay issues. It's too linear. It it only really works for your first gameplay. You know, there's so many things about FNAF where the games don't fully commit to their promise. But that's okay. You can still enjoy them for what they are. I just enjoy Security Breach for the fact it's a broken mess from with memories. <laughs> and that's okay. That is okay. So, let's answer the question, why does FNAF feel different and can it be fixed? Well, let's go back to our two criteria: story and gameplay. Story-wise, the movie. The Five Nights at Freddy's movie was everything I wanted it to be. Simple and clear. Five Nights at Freddy's as a series has a lot of content in it, and therefore giving it to an audience that are brand new who don't already care for the series is just difficult. So it made sense to strip back the story and not rely on these wacky concepts like Remnant and Fazgu and just deliver a simple story that everyone can relate to. The original story. The terror of learning of an event in a newspaper. The terror of the missing children's incident. It lent into that. And it didn't shy away from the goofiness of haunted animatronics. It tells you directly to your face. I love that. That was Five Nights at Freddy's doing something that makes sense in both universe but also our universe and giving it that haunted feeling that plays with our biological sense of eeriness towards auras and spirituality. But gameplay. Gameplay is where it's bloody important because if Security Breach is any indication, story doesn't matter when your gameplay doesn't work. So, how do we fix the gameplay? Enter FNAF The Glitched Attraction. For those who haven't played or haven't seen, Glitched Attraction is a Five Nights at Freddy's escape room horror game and it does everything brilliantly. It captures the vibe of the first few FNAF games to a T, but it also embraces a free roam style and a point and click style really well together. It meshed these styles perfectly. Glitched attraction with each level keeps you enclosed with a threat, right? Keeping you close, making you judge the distance but minimize it when you have to, minimizing your safety. Brilliant. It emphasized a real life environment like FNAF 3 was trying to do. An escape room. Something that people like doing as a fun hobby. And then there's the stress of trying to keep track of everything happening. With each level, the amount of stuff you need to watch out for increases. If an animatronic starts charging towards you, hey, run away if you want, but it's gonna catch you. You're stuck with them. You're managing them. And if you didn't, tough luck. Just like FNAF 2 and FNAF 4, and FNAF 1. And somehow, this game manages to even make sense of Security Breach's shitty story. Somehow, it puts it all back together the way it was meant to be. 
So, I'm not going to delve any more into it because I want you to play it. All FNAF fan games are free, after all, so download it, enjoy it for yourself, and see what FNAF could have in store sometime in the future. If you do like this style of content, please tell me I'm trying to lean into more cinematic but also video essay formats. I'm really having fun with these types of videos, so thank you for watching. Subscribe if you feel like it, grab a cookie on the way out, and I'll see you in the next one.